Okay, welcome to uh, this morning's meeting on uh, Do All Revolutions Lead to Tyranny? Uh, it's part of the Leninism in the 21st Century course. Uh, and today we have uh, Judith Orr, who's editor of Socialist Worker, uh, who was in Tahir Square during the Egyptian Revolution three years ago. Uh, she's going to speak for approximately 30 minutes, um, at which point there will be a chance for people to make contributions, uh, ask questions, etc. And then toward, at the end, Judith will come back and, uh, and answer. Now, that's a form that we take. The, there aren't sleepers, sleepers, <laughs> sleepers, <laughs> slips. That boring. Yeah, or, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to snore, go to the back, please. Um, <laughs> Normally, you'd have a microphone here where people could come up and ask questions, but it's here, tiny little thing. So hopefully, uh, it's picking up every, what, everything that people are saying. So uh, you, you probably stay where you are when you ask a question, just uh, speak loud. Anyway, without any more ado, uh, over to Judith. Thank you. Well, those... Um <laughs> Those <laughs> nice party. The heady days of Terrier Square really do seem a long way away now, don't they? When you when you look at uh, what's going on, but it's important to remember what the beginning of that revolution was like. Just to remind ourselves that it, you know, for all the talk now, that it was and continues to be a genuine social revolution, popular uh, revolution that involved millions of people on the streets, with workers mobilised in their workplaces with strikes, and the levels of self-organization and change that happened even in just the, that beginning part of the revolution, the 18 days that brought down Mubarak, um, let alone the months that followed. I mean, in those 18 days, you saw people take up organization which turned Tahrir Square into a small city of its own. There was pharmacies in the doorways with people in their doctor's outfits that had all their drugs and medicines. And in the mornings, doctors and nurses would go and do the rounds. People would sit in a circle in the square and they'd walk around and take their pulse and deliver medicine to them and listen to their, um, listen to their problems. Um, there was water distribution, food shared. Every day the square became more sophisticated. People had slept under tarpaulins and a few rugs at the beginning. Each day they became, you know, people brought plastic chairs, some brought tents. At the beginning people stood on the little wall in the middle and made speeches. Then people brought big step ladders and stood on the top of step ladders in the middle of the road to give speeches. By the end of the 18 days there was huge great stages with sound systems. At the beginning somebody plugged a, a TV into a cafe and had it sitting out so people could see the news because the internet was shut down for a long period. Again, a few days later, people had sewn together massive sheets and hanged them from one of the, the windows of, of a block of flats on the side of the square, and Al Jazeera was projected up onto the side of this building. And so people were standing in the square, hundreds of thousands of people watching Al Jazeera, showing film of them, thousands of people standing in a square, but it gave people the sense of the world is watching us. Um, and it was just that sense of imagination and creativity to make the square their own um, and also there's the art the graffiti is utterly wonderful continues to be um, evocative around uh, around um, the whole of Cairo and other Egyptian cities songs that people said had not been heard for 10 20 30 40 years poetry it was just an explosion if you like of the uh, popular will of the ability to say we want something different than we've lived under this crushing dictatorship and indeed they people mocked the dictator mocked Mubarak in a way that they couldn't have imagined doing only days before when the secret police followed people and held people down and you know the, the sense of uh, potential for unity and solidarity was tremendous and uh, across the divide of religion and non-religion you know there there was Christians Jews Muslims Muslims who wore the full niqab or the hijab people who wore no head covering you know everybody was there and lots of homemade placards described that as being something that there was a strength police stations were burnt out the day before I arrived all the police stations in Cairo were burnt out so when I was going from the airport the little car had to move around all these burnt out sort of police vans that they'd freed prisoners from the police had uh, taken off their uniforms and run away and ordinary men and women stood on the edge of the square checking ID to make sure you were not a cop um, in terms of taking over control people directed the traffic and somebody said oh yeah it used to be one way this way but we thought that was inefficient so now we're making it a two-way street you know so so even to the tiniest things people took control and they succeeded let's not forget they brought down Mubarak no, nobody else did this 
those ordinary people across Egypt brought down Mubarak, the most powerful dictator, backed by the West to the hilt. People brought up all the tear gas canisters and saying to me, look, made in the US. You know, that sense that actually he should have been utterly all powerful and never be able to be brought down. He was a tyrant and he was brought down. And the ruling class in the region looked on with horror, didn't they? And across the world, actually. What, if it could happen to Mubarak, it could happen to me. But of course, you look at it today. And the military, first of all, took control under SCAF after the 18 days. And then the Muslim Brotherhood president was elected, Mercy. And now, today, the old Mubarak state seems as strong as ever, with El Sisi in charge. The counter-revolution giving itself a facade of democracy, if you like, in having him elected. But he is really um, part of the old Mubarak state. We have protesters that are being shot in the street, students shot on campus. There's hundreds of Brotherhood supporters who face the sentence of hanging. And socialists are being hounded, jailed and tortured. In fact, some of the comrades there say, in many ways, the state at the moment is unleashed to an extent that they hadn't even seen really in the latter years of Mubarak. At the height of Mubarak's powers, this was what they were suffering. But actually, in the latter years, there was a sense of a shifting of balance. And in some ways, it's actually worse than those latter years. And all the prejudice from right-wing commentators is coming out, isn't it? Certainly, around the times of the revolution, we got a lot of it. You know, Arabs, they need a strong man. Or do they know how to do democracy like us? Like as if something we've got you know, here with this coalition of Tories and Liberal Democrats is the height, you know, a popular expression of what we wanted. Nobody wanted the coalition, did they? Nobody voted for what we got, but somehow or other, everybody has to look at these Arabs. Oh dear, they can't aspire, they can't possibly fulfill the high standards of democracy you'd expect in the West. What a absolute nonsense. But Part of this narrative is not really just about the uh, Arab revolutions. It's trying to use the example of Egypt that now has a, basically a recycled ruling class in power um, as an example of really the hopelessness of changing the world, isn't it? That's what they want us to believe, that look what happens when you meddle. <laughs> look what happens when you take to the streets. And, you know, it was put um, most uh, powerfully for their side by Simon Jenkins in The Guardian, where he said this, Maidan, Ukraine, Tahrir, Egypt, the square symbolizes failure, not hope. Now that is to write off the revolution in Egypt. Also, it's to compare it to what's happening in Ukraine, which to be honest, is absolutely there's no resemblance. I'm not going to go into that here, there's other meetings. But the, the idea that it's just now so symbolizes um, despair. And I think that, you know, it does feed into what is probably, you know, certainly before the Arab Revolution, so I think you'd probably say most people that you met in the street would probably say, even if they thought it might be a nice thing to have revolutionary change, that it really wasn't possible. I think the Arab revolutions did bring it into reality that this isn't just something that happens in history, that real people can make revolutions. But I still think in terms of a popular common sense, it feeds into the idea of maybe it's just impossible. Maybe we're just not powerful enough. Maybe the system is too strong. And, you know, this feeds into old assertions that come from right-wing commentators, which are assessments of, you know, the great revolution of Russia in 1917. Now, one thing I do want to make a point at the beginning of this meeting, which is a more general meeting about revolutions, is a big difference between what's currently happening and the process that's unfolding of the Egyptian revolution and Russia. Because they're very, very different. I mean, in Russia, in one year of titanic struggles, they had a insurrection, workers' power. This has not happened in Egypt. This is not the process that we're describing in Egypt. The, the, we are in a very different place in the revolutionary process. Um, but, um, but of course, the rise of Stalin in Russia is used as an example, and there's a separate meeting on this. I will touch on it here, but there's a separate meeting on the detail of Russia. Um, it, it led to the aims and the dreams of, of the Russian Revolution being destroyed. And so you do get the refrain, which the meeting, the other meeting's title, did Lenin lead to Stalin? And I will come back to that because it is part of the general arguments that people have. But I just wanted to make clear in terms of the, the concrete reality of where the Russian Revolution got to and where Egypt currently is, they are quite different. But on the more general point, does what happened in Egypt and other revolutions doesn't mean that our sort of vision of change, if you like, is basically fundamentally flawed, that it isn't possible, that defeat is inevitable. Because you do get people say, I'm sure you've had it on paper sales if you're in the SWP and that, you know, well, socialism's a nice idea, but tell me somewhere in the world that it's going on. Show me a society that you'd like to, your 
world to look like? You know, where is socialism? Where is there a place? And of course there isn't, is there? And even places who claim to be socialist aren't, and in fact give socialism a bad name in many ways, just like Russia did for so many, for so many years. And I think that there is really you know, a currency to the argument that really any popular revolt will lead to the idea of some strong man or strong individual coming to the fore. And first up, that often comes from an argument about human nature, that really you know, competitive, doggy dog sort of trying to get to the top is just part of being human. So even under socialism, you're going to get that. And you're going to have to hold back the big powerful person that wants to take charge. And actually, maybe people like that because they're used to it. You know, they haven't really got the ability to make these big decisions about the world. And they're going to, you know, we're hardwired really, in a way, for either acquiescence to a powerful individual or just for greed and competitiveness um, in that way. And I think that we have to completely challenge that view of humanity, utterly. Because is it really, you know, is it the case that even after some great social struggles that those values of competition and greed and profit just simply reassert themselves? And, and that, you know, any attempt we have to change society is just utopian. It's just wrong because, you know, if there's anything, I mean, it's got briefly touched on in a meeting I was just out there now about science. If there's anything that really signifies anything that is part of our human nature is that actually humans' greatest achievements have come through collective endeavour that actually we would have gone the way of the dinosaurs if we were not social beings. The only way human society has evolved and lasted on this world is both because we're conscious human beings, we're part of nature but able to change it, but also because actually as social beings, we have managed to live in various different climates and habitats around the whole globe, utterly different. You know, the Antarctic to the Amazon, you know, you need different ways of living, you need different shelter, clothes, you have to find different food. You know, humans can do this, but they've never done it. You know, Marx made the joke, you know, we're not Robinson Crusoe. You know, there's nobody that is an individual. You can't live as an island as a human. It has to be um, <coughs> from the earliest human societies who lived in small bands. That is how humans are. And therefore, when we talk about that collective that's intrinsic, I believe, to part of human history, you know, I mean, people use different examples to explain it. I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's some years old now, but it still strikes me as one of the most effective examples. If people remember, some of you, when 33 Chilean miners were trapped a mile underground for, I think it was over 60 days, they would have died had human nature been about competitive, let me eat all the food, let me drink all the water. Actually, none of them might have survived had that been the case. But they all survived. Why? Because they organized collectively and shared everything in the most organized, disciplined way to eke it out, even when they didn't know anybody was looking for them or could ever get to them. And that's just a simple, even, so it's not even that people say sometimes when things, the going gets tough, that's when people have to fight for it. it you know, I think it will be easier to build socialism today than it might have been years ago because there's the potential of plenty. There's a potential of everybody having enough. But what it proves is even when there isn't, actually the ability of people to act collectively can overcome the worst of situations. I mean, I know it will be talked about this, um, this Marxism a lot because it's the 30th anniversary of the miners' strike. But again, any strike shows how workers are more, collect are more powerful collectively. But even just in terms of how people self-organize in those sort of situations is an expression of people working for the collective good of all. And I think that, therefore, if we come back to... I believe what we can just assert, really, because of, because of history, that human beings are able to, are capable of bringing down dictatorships, bringing down ruling classes and changing society. Perhaps then the big question is, what takes its place? What, what will come in, in the place of capitalist exploitation or of a dictatorship of Mubarak, for example? And because if we just look briefly back at Russia, when I said that they had a successful workers' revolution, compressed into a year, I think revolutions in any country in Western Europe or, or again, we're seeing them um, in, in the Middle East, will take years of events of retreats and advances. And, uh, you know, the, the, the book is not closed yet on those revolutions. But in Russia, this was compressed into, into a year of incredible struggles out of the carnage, the carnage of the First World War, which we remember this year. Um, exploitation and servitude 
around the globe, the revolution being, became something beautiful, became a beacon of hope for millions of people. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have Twitter or Facebook or anything else. But the word Bolshe traveled across Europe, you know, so it led to mutinies of soldiers in northern France, where Bolshe was the word that was used to describe them. Because actually the sense of the Bolsheviks, a sense of resistance, inspired people and actually led to revolts and revolutions in other countries. And I think that uh, when you look at Stalin and people saying it was automatic what happened, absolutely the opposite. Stalinism was the antithesis of the hopes and dreams of the revolution, whether it was for democracy or women's rights or national liberation. But how come? You know, how come that he was able to, um, to take power? And one of the arguments that you do get is, is the, um, the nature of a Leninist sort of organisation, which is the sort of model for the um, Socialist Workers' Party, in some way is particularly susceptible to the idea of some great powerful individual taking part, like Stalin. That's why they say, oh, Lenin led to Stalin. And is it really the case that there was something inherent in how the Bolsheviks organised or their type of party that led to his rise? I, you know, I think you utterly have to, to reject this because it was precisely the opposite. It was precisely because Stalin was a break from the revolutionary process going forward. It was a break from the... Um, the politics of the Leninist Bolshevik organization that he was able to come to power. Nothing symbolizes this more than the fact that he had to murder all the leadership and utterly break from the past in order to carry out the, what effectively was a counter-revolution. The whole core social force of the working class, which makes any revolution, which is the power of any uh, real popular revolution, the cater of the Bolsheviks thrown into battles to beat the, white, the whites and to beat the imperialist power to invade it. All of this meant the, the hollowing out, if you like, of the revolutionary forces in, uh, in the country. And at the same time, when the other revolts failed, Stalin held up the model of building socialism in one country. Well, that's simply not a possibility, and actually the, the possibilities of revolution spreading today are even greater than then, but um, this meant that really you have to look at, um, and you know, Tom will speak about this more uh, on another meeting, that actually Stalin's rise was a product of the defeat of a general mass revolution, not of the revolution itself. And you know, if, other revol if, Ger if the German revolution had been victorious, we may be looking at an utterly different history. We may not even have been sitting here today at Marxism living under capitalism in Britain still had the German revolution been such such is the the future of humanity can rest on the decisions of some revolutionaries of the sort of party they built of when they broke from other bigger parties or you know sometimes a huge great events if you like can hang on just certain decisions and events that seem small perhaps and not so significant at the time but actually have enormous consequences and I'll come back to that at the end. So defeat was not inevitable. Stalinism was not inevitable. It was a product of defeat, a product of the revolution being smashed. But now to think about what the arguments are about current revolutions and revolts today to come back to the question. And I think that one of the things that keeps coming back and why people think that what happened in Egypt perhaps is inevitable, you know, is, is really questions about the state, isn't it? Is the state really just too powerful? Is it something that really ordinary people, they just keep coming up against it? I mean, people see it in ordinary struggles, even without being at the height of revolution, whether it's the student protests, whether it's strikes, poll tax riot, you know, you've seen how the police treat protesters, you know, even when things are, we're not threatening the power of the ruling class, you can see the power of the state, and you see it to terrible price in, uh, in Egypt. I mean, you know, and one significant thing about the Egyptian revolution is the state wasn't broken. And, you know, it's not that people were naive about this. You know, when I tried to interview and talk to people in the square, they were very clear. They didn't just want the figurehead to go. And they said this. We don't want just rid of Mubarak. We want rid of all the little Mubaraks, is what they call them, which is all the secret police. Every student university would, would have an office next to the sort of the equivalent of the dean, which was the secret police officer for the university campus. You know, they wanted rid of the way and they used to describe it as a cobweb of, of the state that was in every institution, every part of Egyptian society was a sense of how the state, and actually in Egypt there's something else which is pretty unique there, which is also it's part of the economy. It runs part of big business and fact and everything else but but forget that for the moment we're just talking about the, the state as a whole it was it was every there and why is you know what is the role of the state I mean really the state has you know in Britain today there's elements of the welfare state that we fight to defend and expand of course 
but actually at the core of what the why we have a state, what a state is for, is to uphold the status quo. What is the status quo? The status quo is a tiny minority exploiting, oppressing, and repressing the majority. Most of the time, it doesn't need to go and batten us over the head. It'll only do that when it's forced to. It would rather that we all felt just through the sheer burden of poverty and bills, that we go out to work every day, that we just obey things, that we just act in a way that um, acquiesces to the rules and acquiesces to the way society is run. It's only when really things reach their height that they have to really, um, I was going to say unveil themselves, but actually what they normally do is put on more stuff, isn't it, to come out and beat us up. But that sense of the state showing its... Um, it's true thing. I mean, Trotsky put it like this when he talked about the, the state of Stalin, you know, how it got to grip. And he said, you know, when there's enough goods in a store, the purchasers can come whenever they want to. Where there's little goods, they're compelled to stand in line. And he talked about when the lines are very long, you have to appoint a policeman to keep order. And then he said this was how the Soviet bureaucracy ran, uh, arose. And it basically, because decisions are made on who gets what and the potential of violence uh, with a big, with a great club in his hand of the state is, is absolutely there. And I think this is the thing that we have to have to see that the state is not just some neutral body standing aside from society upholding whichever ruling class is elected I mean to be honest some of the state are even very suspicious of the Labour Party and you know people have been exposed in the Secret Service you know of actually trying to you know do um, black propaganda against Labour politicians on the basis that they feel they are a bit threatening, which really seems quite unbelievable today. But that sense of, you know, there's no way that it is just, um, that there's no way that it is just something that stands on the outside. And that means that, you know, revolutions cannot just lay hold of them. I mean, Lenin put this very well in State and Revolution until he was interrupted by a revolution. But you can't just lay hold of the state and use it to your own ends. And I think that, that this is something, you know, that has been learned to terrible cost by the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. I think it shows the example of that because, you know, when I said people weren't naive, people wanted to break the state. But the fact was the revolutionary process simply wasn't strong enough right back then in 2011 to carry through after getting rid of Mubarak. The workers struggles, which are at the core of the power of any, um, uh, of any workers' revolution, were not strong enough. Unions had been illegal. There was fragile organisation. You know, this was a sense of a fledgling movement that didn't have the strength. And therefore, the, the, what happened in terms of the Muslim Brotherhood, and remember, these are organisations in Egypt which had been repressed, tortured, imprisoned by the Mubarak state for decades. And therefore, when Mursi was elected, um, they were the best known and most rooted organisation, you know, so not surprising they were the first organisation to win uh, popular elections both to Parliament and to the Presidency. But when he was elected, he basically said to big business and the security forces, I'm going to work with you because, you know, the revolution's got me elected and I'm a big businessman myself, many of us in the Brotherhood are too, you know, the young, you know, sort of the youth, they're okay, you know, maybe they're a bit fiery, they were in Tahrir Square, but no, no, we're going to manage Egypt for you, and people look to us, and I'm of that sense of, and they also in, in, um, gave more powers to the police um, to, to basically hold back a revolution which had put them in power. You know, Mercy would not have been president without a revolution, but actually what he wanted to do was stop the revolution going any further. They wanted to make it stable, and therefore you had a, a situation where the old remnants of the old regime, people call them the Falul and the military, decided they would try and do business with Mercy on the basis that he might be able to basically dampen and hijack and in some way co-opt the revolution and actually create a calm and stable Egypt for them to continue to do business in, to thrive in and to keep control of. But of course, you know, a revolution isn't something that you can just put back in a box like that. And actually, people weren't going to say, oh, great, we've got a brotherhood president, we'll all go home now. And actually, he presided over the highest number of strikes, of protests, of any of the period of, uh, of the revolution. And uh, it, people became dissatisfied with him in hugely quickly, which meant one year on, millions took to the streets and brought him down. Now, this is a story that we'll hear in some other meetings, but I think the key thing was that actually when he went 
there was a vacuum. And this was the sense of how, you know, how uh, a revolution can then suddenly go into retreat from this huge go forward, was actually then there was a gap. The military had already got behind some of the, the million marches to get Mercy out because they saw then the opportunity perhaps of really getting a grip back on Egyptian society. And that is, and that is what they did. And so now the new powers and the very same state Mercy had used against revolutionaries was now being used against him and the Brotherhood and anybody else who protested, anybody else who said, we want to further the needs of the revolution. So you did see the state, having not been uh, smashed by the revolution, then being used to, to be trying to be co-opted by elements of the revolution who thought they could stop it going any further and is now being used to stop the revolution as a whole. And so that's, if there is ever a lesson in modern history that we are witnessing tragically with our own eyes about the role of the state, it is Egypt. And I think this is something absolutely vital. And now, you know, our comrades, the revolutionary socialists in Egypt, were absolute stalwarts. They wanted mercy out. He was not delivering. But when the Brotherhood were being attacked in the squares and murdered, they said, this is wrong. It, they were against the military. They were in a minority and they're paying the price because, you know, we have revolutionary socialists in prison and uh, being targeted. But that sense of actually understanding the state is never your friend, the state is never going to deliver for a revolution, is something that, um, is something that, we, have to, that we have to be strong about, um, you know, holding that, holding that argument out. And I think that what we see there is a, is a very serious setback to the revolutionary protest process. But this can be used as an argument to say that revolutions aren't possible, that these are all inevitable products of, um, of, getting, um, of getting involved in, in revolutions, which is, you know, it is part of ruling class ideology. And yet, of course, what the ruling class don't want us to really understand is the only reason they're in power is because they had revolutions. You know, current bourgeois society is a product of some huge mass popular and, and sometimes violent revolutions. You know, the fact that people claim we didn't have a revolution is because they just call it a civil war, isn't it, in England? You know? And this is something that uh, Thatcher, Ma Maggie Thatcher said. Uh, she was denouncing um, French anniversary uh, celebrations of the French Revolution in France. And she said, we English, is how she put it, had in 1688 our quiet revolution, where Parliament exerted will over the king. It was not the sort of revolution that France was. I think she forgot that we chopped the head off a king long before <laughs> France. And, you know, but that sense of how she was rewriting history, I think, is, um, is there. And I think that, therefore, what we did see was the bourgeois revolutions toppled monarchies, broke feudalism, brought into being capitalism, if you like, which actually has then unleashed new abilities for humanity to go forward. The fact of the layer, you know, the ability to produce enough for everybody for the first time, but also it produced its grave digger. That's a great contradiction, isn't it? Capitalism, a horrible exploitative system, has produced the very social force that can bring it down. And I think this is where we keep talking about the, um, the class that has the power to bring socialism for the first time came into being. And therefore, for every revolution, if we're talking about um, how do we stop a tyrant taking over? How do we stop counter-revolution? How do we stop the rise of a bureaucracy? It has to be about the workers' revolution, about workers being at the core of it. The workers mobilising in the latter of those 18 days was the critical point that meant Mubarak went. And, and that's the critical weakness as well about not being able to drive that, that forward. Because you see, street protests are an absolute part of the Egyptian revolution and other revolutions. Absolutely fantastic. But actually, they can be broken more easily by state repression than can workers organised at the point of production where they have their power. They're, they're, you know, and actually, to be honest, all the media, all they concentrate on is street protests because they don't really understand the power of workers at the point of production. But that sense of understanding what makes a revolution more powerful is, is if workers are at the core. And, you know, the working class is a unique social force. It isn't just that we like them better than we like these other people. It's, there's a new, unique intrinsic drive for unity to overcome divisions and to act in a cooperative and collective way. And it's that that gives us the greatest potential for democracy. Not for a dictator, but for democracy. Genuine democracy flows from the organizations and the way that we're forced to cooperate under capitalism to be a collective class. And I think that the feature of every genuine popular vote has been uh, unleashing of democracy, an unleashing of creativity, and of people feeling that they've got an ability to control things. It's the opposite of how people in the ruling class try to make you think revolutions are like. And just remember, even the word <coughs> Soviet, you know, invented during the Russian Revolution, was not something that came out of a book. The 
this is, dem this is democracy as we know it, you must have. It came from the workers. It came from the struggle because the struggle opens people's eyes to new possibilities. And uh, this is where it came. And I think, therefore, the organisation of the working class um, being at the core is actually the greatest bulwark either against the rise of a bureaucracy like Stalin or certainly to challenge uh, the rise of dictators <coughs> um, and the ruling class reasserting its power. So really the conclusion is Revolutions don't lead to tyranny, but the defeat of revolutions leads to tyranny. And that's question is, you know, how do we make sure that doesn't happen to us? You know, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? How do we, what can we do, you know, to, to, um, to stop this happening? And really it's all down to the conscious organisation, the political organisations that are rooted in the working class steeled and tested in struggles. It's not actually about what necessarily happens at the moment on the 30th of June in 2013, like in Egypt or, you know, at the height. It's actually things that happen today and tomorrow by people like us that can actually shape those events. And this is why, you know, if we go back to the Revolutionary Socialists, that moment, you know, in June when they realised that they were calling for a general strike, they were trying to rid the movement of some of the military and right-wing elements that were trying to, you know, direct it towards the military, but they simply didn't have the ability to do that. And not that that means it's all over, but it means that uh, because the objective conditions that led to the revolution are still there, still I answered. But, you know, we have to see that these, that the critical moments were actually having revolutionary organisation that can say, no, this is the way we should go, and people listen because they trust you, because you're part of the class and you're part of the political leadership that they've seen in the past is so important. Because revolutions are not linear affairs. And often you don't know what are critical moments until you look back afterwards. And in fact, you know, uh, there's a wonderful article that Sammy, a leading revolutionary socialist, has just written where he says actually back then it wasn't clear to exactly what the nature of things going on were. But th they're not linear affairs in the sense that you don't just get one victory, one victory, a little setback, then another little bit of forward, and then socialism, or then a tyrant takes over. You know, these are things that have huge contradictions. When the mass of ordinary people get flung on to the stage of history, these um, there are things that can be, uh, you know, other, other social forces rise who try to co-opt it. You know, maybe it will be somebody the equivalent of Ken Livingston will come to the fore and say, no, 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 we don't really need to push it as far as that. What we need to do is this. And actually, but that can open the door then for right-wing elements and other elements to reassert themselves. And so that sense of the, um, the possibilities of other forces, they won't, it won't necessarily be that well, somebody will walk along going, I'm the tyrant and I want to take over. There can be other elements, reformist elements and others, that will be, put, because if we're talking about political debates and the vibrancy of popular revolutions, it won't just be here's the SWP and here's a Tory and here's a military person. You know, actually, there'll be new forces brought in that have never been politicised you know, people who've never been in struggle as well as people who've been involved in lots of struggles and lots of other, you know, people will be popping up to say, no, I've got the answer, we should do this or calm down, calm, we don't want to uh, provoke the police, you know, you can see all the different arguments and therefore for a revolutionary organisation to have the ability to be able to give a lead in those circumstances, it's about building in the here and now. And actually, you know, that maybe sometimes doesn't seem that exciting, does it? Getting your Sainsbury's carrier bag full of papers and petitions and going off, you know, <laughs> to be part of a meeting or a protests or whatever it is but actually it's what we do now that really makes a difference it's not something you know sparkly and you know something that I'm going to just reach out about and say this is the magic solution so that our revolution won't end in Tyria. It's, it's about that solid work in the class. Because if we really do believe it's possible to change the world, if we're not just here at Marxism for some sort of academic exercise to have a few interesting talks, which they will be, for me, this is a school for us for to be able to go out and change the world. It isn't just about the past and look at these other countries. It's about how you and me and all of us and all of those others in the working class that want to see change, how we can really do it. We have to come back to it's our ability to be able to... Um, to help build the strength of our side, the confidence of our side, the understanding of the lessons of history for our side. All of that is what we can do as revolutionaries. I don't think we can do it as individuals. I think we have to be in an organisation to do these things because only an organisation can deliver what the class needs at the moments of struggle when actually the decision of which way do we go, which road do we take, do we confront the police today or perhaps we should wait for greater forces the following day? Because it's not always that we'll be saying, go, go, go. Because sometimes we'll have to be saying, no, 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 we're not quite ready. Maybe we'll need to wait. And other people might be saying, no, you're just being conservative. That's terrible. 
all of these are things that we can learn. We can make mistakes. The more involved you are in struggle, the more likely you are to make mistakes. It's the purists on the left who stand on the sidelines going, oh dear, oh look at you've done that, that's terrible. But these are people who've never had to lead. They never had to take responsibility for people in a strike. They never had to be looked to when people say, what do we do now? You know, in the middle of a, of a riot or in the middle of a march or in the middle of a strike. It's actually, you know, when you've been in that position, you realize what the enormous responsibility it is. And therefore, that's why you need a party and an organization, if you like, that both can uh, deliver to you, each of us as individuals, if you like, the lessons of the whole history of our class, both in Britain and across the world, but also the sense of how we all feel that we are stronger as part of that collective, stronger ideologically, but also stronger to be able to give a practical lead in the day-to-day -day struggle. Because I hope that is what the SWP does. It isn't just about analysing things. It's also about tomorrow, where can we go with this campaign, this strike? How can we make it win? You know, very practical, concrete things to say, where do we go from here? Whether it's the Lambeth strike, whether it's one of the issues about fighting against um, fascism. And so I suppose, you know, the end of the thing really is it's capitalism who produces tyrants. Our job is to bring down capitalism and we can see an end to those sorts of dictatorships, exploitation and oppression forever. And that'll be down to what all of us here do. Thanks very much. My name's Sheila from Yorkshire. Okay. Um, there's two things I want to raise under this. One is the Freedom Riders in Barnsley. I don't know whether people have heard of it. I'm sure you have. Yeah. Okay. I'm not one of them. Don't give me a clap. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was. Um, the point is that those people in the 60s, 70s and 80s, right, got together. Some of them are still trade union members. You know, most of them are, in fact and decided they weren't putting up with what was happening, which was taking their free passes off them if they were disabled or if they were 60 and over, I think it was. And they weren't putting up with it. So most of you, I gather, will know the story. Am I right? Yeah. Right. But the interesting thing about it is, it's a very clever story because the police were very... Um, this, this is the things that excite me because when they all come together, do you know what I mean? And what they did was they fooled the police on three or four occasions. Right, <coughs> by police turning up, nothing, fine, pat on the head, get on the train, don't pay your fare, come back, let you go. No problem, right? But what happened eventually was, we're getting so sick of it, you see, when they got on the train in Barnsley and went to Sheffield, there were a load of police at the other side and said they couldn't get back on the train to Barnsley unless they paid. So they said, well, we're not paying. Then one bright spark said, why don't we go around over at Bridge, over there, and get the train to Sheffield and refuse to pay? So they all marched over this bridge. Police had not a clue, right, what they were doing. Went over the bridge, got on the train and went to Sheffield, right? Free. Now this happened three or four times until the police had had enough and then they kettled them, basically. And there were brutality there. How disgusting a society that actually brutalises you know, disabled people and people that are over 60 because they want to keep what is theirs that they've worked for all their lives and been promised in their pensions or whatever. How brutally savage is that? So it just shows you, it's not just children that is attacked under uh, capitalism and that's a big deal. It's aged people, it's everybody and they've stood up and they've won half of it, they've won for the passes to go back free to the uh, disabled. Now they're carrying on still with the disabled with them to win it for the ones that aren't disabled. So I think, you know, when Judith talks about people coming together, you know, in all these things, these victories or these struggles are so important to give everybody else confidence to say, I'm not on my own, there are other people, I'll join the trade union, I'll see what it's about, I'll stand up to this, that and the other. And it's amazing what happens. Thank you. It's just a code into what you were saying, really, because I was outside the, the uh, courts when they, they, the two they arrested him. It's a demo. <coughs> but one of the... I mean, I know it's all on the internet, but, but I'm thinking it was a miscalculation by the police. But they thought they got it because they thought they got all the ordinary passengers away and then they could behave as they liked what they had there. Because it was, it was intimidation. They could have done it other ways, but the idea was physically scare them and stop them. And 
people were taking, of course, using their, their phones and cameras. And so they, they took everyone's camera and wiped it, everyone's phone. There's a, a journalist, because Jen who was one of the organisers, a cold journalist, and when he was doing it, they took it, they threatened him under the anti-terrorism law if he didn't hand over the mm -hmm. camera, so they could wipe it. But, the thing, but there was still one, <laughs> I think it was Jen's, at waist level that they missed. And that's why it's on the internet. But I'm thinking, overall, the, the change in communications that, that, that I sometimes thought, damn, we could have won the miners' strike if we'd had phone, you know, camera phones. You know, because they, they lied so much and they got away with it. I don't know, but the thing is, it's sort of, well, they're aware of the danger. That's why they're trying to stop it. So it's just, but does it make any difference when it goes out or not? Do people look? Do people care? It's but I think it's a potential anyway, so that was just my code to what you said. <laughs> right, the front row are setting a fine example when it comes to questioning. I know they don't have to move, but... Uh... <coughs> Yeah, do you want, yeah, is that okay? Yeah, just come up and, and we'll take uh, the other hand there next. I'm sorry, step over the dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's there. You can probably come okay. around the back. Oh, right. yeah, that would be Don't worry, yeah. anywhere there. That's a question yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Actually, my roots are in Met Cork as well, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> um, it's about uh, feminism, its presence or its absence um, mm. in the revolution, and mm. particularly the early days of Tapir Square. Because women, as we know, did play a big role in, in, in the whole, mm -hmm. you know, the whole melee, the whole um, uh, creation of, of, of the, uh, the protests to start with. Um, mm -hmm. But even at the early stage, I think when the programme was being, w w was, was, was being created, that, that there were still the complaints were coming that women's uh, issues, women's rights weren't being considered as they felt they should have been. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, the, it was the old kind of situation of, oh, build a revolution first and then, you know, we come to your issues kind of thing. Um, and, but, but I mean, they did, uh, you know, they, they were kind of going veiled as those that wanted to. Um, they had a big role to play. They were, they were, you know, they were finding their feet like they'd never had before mm -hmm. under, under Mubarak. Um, I was speaking out and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, of course, um, well, I suppose beginning with Morsi and, and, and now, the, the situation is, is even worse. They have to cover up even more. The level of sexual assault is, 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 is enormous. But in the early days of Tamir Square as well, I mean, there were troubling, sort of um, troubling uh, 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 reports of sexual assaults, attempted rapes, even even rape in, in the midst of the of the huge mass of crowds that there were. Um, some of them were coming from obviously reactionary forces. Um, so, what, what was your experience of, of feminism and, and the role of women there? Um, and at what point did it start? begin to be rolled back. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, I wanted to make two points, if I may. First was just to reply, if I can, a bit to the question that was asked about <coughs> what is the working class. This is quite a big question. Uh, in fact, there's a whole course on this question of Marxism. <laughs> so all I will briefly say is that for Marxists, the working class are people who have to sell their labour power to work. That's the economic definition. Because it's a very mystified term, I think, in lots of ways, who is the working class. And we hear lots of myths that the working class has shrunk, it's disappeared, whatever. Actually, the working class is growing as an international force. And for Marxists, we judge the working class not by whether you do what are seen as stereotypical working class jobs, you go, you know, which actually change over time. What people think of the stereotypical <coughs> working class jobs have changed throughout history. But today, people tend to think it's the people who do heavy labour, who go down the mines, who do work in the steel industry. That's not what we mean by working class. So the thousands of public sector workers who were on strike yesterday, the millions, over a million, were part of the working class. They're people who go to work, who help to create the wealth in society, who have helped to ha keep society going. The teachers who teach people, who are going to be the next generation of workers themselves, are absolutely part and parcel of the working class. So for us, working class is a much broader sense than what people think of as just the narrow people who make things in factories. The working class is a much bigger, broader group of people, and as such has much bigger power. There's also a wider political sense that Marx talked about the working class, which is the other people who also rely on people who have to go to work. So pensioners, 
The children are working class people, and that's why the working class actually is the majority of people in the world today. It is the majority of people who are forced to live through the market in one way or another, either through themselves going to work for a wage, because that's how we survive, or through being dependent on people or on dependent um, on the state. So there was a much wider sense um, of the working class. There are obviously people who work on the land, but I would say people who work on the land is transforming dramatically in much of the world as more and more of agricultural work gets pulled into capitalist relations of production. And just because you work on the land doesn't mean you're a peasant. Actually, in many parts of the global south, there are still lots of peasants. Peasants are people who work on the land to produce food that they consume themselves or in groups of people that they consume themselves. Actually, there are also huge agribusinesses where people are agricultural workers who are producing food not to eat themselves, but are producing food to be sold on the market and traded as a commodity on the market and all the food hoarding that goes along with that. So you have to think, I think if you're thinking about, I don't know enough about West Cork to know quite which sort of production we're talking about, but actually I think when you look at the global picture, you have to think not all agricultural workers are peasants. Many of them are part of a growing and spreading working class. And my final point, if I may, is I actually just wanted to come briefly back to the question of tyranny, because I think Judith is absolutely right when you talk about where do tyrants come from, because I think there is a stereotype that we're given out there that tyrants are kind of strong dictators who fool the passive, stupid people by whipping up great speeches and brainwashing people. But actually, if you look at concrete examples of where tyrants have come to power, it is in periods of great crisis, and it is, as Judy says, off the back of the defeats of struggles of working class people to, um, to change society. You think about a couple of examples. I mean, we talked to, Judith's already talked about Stalin and she talked about the process in Egypt. You could think about who's the most famous tyrant in history, Hitler. Well, how, well, this is another whole big topic, but actually off the back of a massive crisis in German capitalism, a revolution in Germany that was then defeated, you then see the rise of Hitler. And you, we can explain where these people come from because they come from the defeat of something different. And our job has got to be make sure that we're not defeated. Mm. Yeah. Go again. Could, could you say something about Mao? about what happened in China mm. at this time. Yep, thank you. Just a short thing. Um, you didn't mention the Americans, South America and Cuba. Mm -hmm. I've been to Cuba myself. Things are changing there. I wonder what the changes are. Is it equivalent to 1919 in Bolshevik Russia? They're just trying to a bit of capital and self-employment and that sort of thing. Or is it going to, after Castro goes, back to full capitalism? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they kill Stalin? Why didn't... The Bolsheviks were being picked off. Why did one of them get a fucking gun and stop the process? What what tells but didn't that nothing held him back? Held the others back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, my name's Tom. I'm actually gonna be uh, <laughs> speaking on Lenin to Stalin on Sunday morning, the hangover shift. So you'll uh, get so your answer uh, there. If uh, people yeah. wanna come to that, feel free. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose I wanted to kind of address that question, really. Why didn't they kill Stalin? Because I think it's important... I mean, first of all, I think it's important to say that whilst our politics are, is based on the role of the individual... Um, and uh, sorry, on, on <laughs> sorry, on the role that, of the collective and the way that workers in struggle together can change society, but it's also important to bear in mind that individuals can be very important, absolutely. <laughs> what Judith said, in fact, Trotsky, um, Lenin's great re uh, great comrade, really, said that without Lenin in Rus coming to Russia in February 1917 and saying all power to the Soviets, that there wouldn't 
of being a Russian revolution, uh, well, at least the October Revolution, the Russian, uh, the revolution that people know about. Why was that? Not because Lenin himself was some great man, although if you do read these books, he's quite fantastic. It was because he made arguments about uh, uh, the way forward, about all power to the Soviets, about uh, 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 the redistribution of land and so on. And without Lenin doing that, um, it would, it, uh, 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 the Bolsheviks wouldn't have made those arguments within the class, and without that happening, the, 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 the working class wouldn't have ultimately uh, taken, taken power. At the same time as individuals can play an important role, the, Stalin, just as a character himself, can't be, can't explain what happened in Russia. And again, I mean, I've written a 30 minute meeting on this, so I can't really go through it in all of the detail now, but it's important to say that what happened in Russia wasn't simply because Stalin was a nasty man or because Lenin was a nasty man and hid it well until Stalin took, uh, 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 took power, but it actually represented the failure, well, two things really. First of all, the isolation of Russia and uh, of, of the Russian Revolution, and also the failure of the Russian uh, 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 and the, the decimation of the Russian working class. You see, the economic situation in Russia was absolutely uh, desperate, really, as a result of the civil war and imperialist war. Uh, in, I think. Uh, uh, industrial production was at about a third of what it had been. Russia had lost half of its population. The working class was half its size and so on. And because of that, Lenin said that the working class had been knocked out of its class groove, really. That the people who had made the revolution, the working class, were no longer in a position of strength. Ultimately, they were in a position of disorganisation. And because of that, and the fact that the revolution didn't spread to places like Germany, that meant that different forces and different idea, uh, the different forces which represented different ideas were within 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 Russian society, and ultimately different classes were able to take advantage of the situation. And I think really that's how you explain the rise of Stalinism. Not because Stalin <coughs> was some awful man, but ultimately because those forces had a tremendous effect on what happened in Russia, and also a tremendous effect on the Bolshevik Party itself. Should they have killed Stalin? Well, who knows what, it, uh, what difference it might have had, but ultimately the, the failure of the Russian Revolution can only be understood with an understanding of the material forces which, which came into play on the revolution. some uh, sort of wide-ranging comments. Um, I live in Brixton in South London and uh, when the Stop the War movement was at its best at a local level um, there was a sudden change in social optimism. I mean there were parties, mm -hmm. people came from different groupings, came together there was less fear of between people. And yet, at that stage, as I understand it, I wasn't at the meeting, but the SWP did not come to an agreement with the Green Party, for instance, um, on a strategy over respect candidates. I don't want to dwell on that, but I do wonder if, given the fact that so many movements for social change nowadays are popular movements and they're fueled by the changes in uh, mass media and communication whether there's a need for left-wing groups to find alliances at that point in time when there's an it, and it when there's a movement like stop the war um, and perhaps not be so, um, I can't think of the word I'm going to say, perfectionist. <laughs> so perfectionist in terms of policy and, and um, in the alliances they make. And I'm really just throwing that in as a uh, subject of conversation. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah. One there, and you can go next, and then oh, we've suddenly got a burst here. Yeah. I just want to talk on that point and about talking with diff uh, working with different groups and building alliances. Um, and I'm going to relate that to an experience I've had this year in, in Manchester where we were working on um, working with Unite Against Fascism and other organisations to um, in the uh, uh, campaign to get Nick Griffin out of this European Parliament seat. And I think we, we need to analyse each position at each time. Um, and, and there isn't like one right or wrong as to who we were with when. And I'm, I'm, I wasn't involved in the issue with Stop the War in, in Brixton at the time. Um, but I think what we have to do uh, in the Socialist Worker Party and on the left is, is we're continually analysing where we are at a particular time over each issue and what effect that will have. It, you know, we were working with a wide range of people, we went out doing joint leafleting with the Labour Party, <coughs> but we weren't going to give out Labour Party leaflets, you know, for their candidate. But we all met together, all all um, started together. We gave out United Gates fascist leaflets, they gave out their own leaflets. We were also putting first stand up against UKIP leaflets. And, you know, we were really successful and it was great to be outside the town hall and see, um, see Nick Griffin really struggling to, to get in there um, again for a second time. And, you know, we heard um, uh, before it was announced that, that he'd lost his seat and they came out after absolutely devastated and it was a fantastic night. I'm really <laughs> pleased that I was able to be there. But I, I think just on the, on the latest point, it's... I don't think we, we, anyone here is going to call ourselves perfectionist. I think what we try and do is, is just analyse at each point, and it isn't. We can make mistakes. It isn't, you know, it, it isn't. There isn't any perfect. Um, you know, we haven't got a textbook to go through and just, you know, follow, follow a process. We have to just think at each time what is the right thing to do in this current situation. Thank you. Thank you. It's following on from what the last comrade said because it's it does make you think when when people talk about you know the mistake of, of a decision made at one point or a, a certain meeting or what have you you can you can either fall on sort of think well uh, I've made a mistake therefore we, we don't do anything further about it or actually I've made plenty of mistakes in my time but actually what you do is <laughs> and I'll probably carry on making mistakes but it's, it's being involved in what's going on is actually the, the, the key point because if you uh, as, a, as a revolutionary, being involved in a whole number of things, you know, getting up on a, you know, a cold morning yesterday and going out on a picket line and you're thinking, I'm there because we want to make, a, put ourselves in a point of leadership on, on strike yesterday. We want to persuade people not to cross picket lines. There's people I don't like particularly on the picket line with me, but actually you're there for a, a united cause and actually to try and take things forward. The difference between a, a, a revolutionary and someone who's coming to it new is actually you want to try and influence that person to say there are decisions that we can make collectively that, can take, that can take things forward. And I think the example of uh, the revolution in, in, uh, in, in Egypt is, is an absolutely key, key, key case. Um, where if the revolutionary organisations are not large enough to actually have that influence of the networks that we build up <coughs> through our working lives and through our political lives actually make all the difference. So had the, the, the revolutionary organisation in Egypt be, been, been bigger and had a wider influence, actually that could have made the difference in the outcomes of, of the revolution there instead of seeing mercy and then seeing the, 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 the forces of reaction uh, now. And I think if you look at other areas, I mean, I think... It, if you look back a few years, there's, there's a whole number of revolutions or in, in the past, massive movements. The Stop the War movement is a great example of that. Massive uh, upsurge of, of, of people feeling a sense of confidence and stuff. 
Um, and actually, we're, I, I feel in, in a lot of senses now we're, it, we're in an age of, 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 of reaction. You know, if you look at Egypt and you look at the coalition government here, you look at UKIP and stuff like that. But within that, there's always a, 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 a crack, a, a little niche you can get into to say, we want to extend our influences. Um, and, and therefore, having a, a set of politics that actually understands how individuals within the movements actually make a difference is actually important. It's not just some, some person's going to come out of the, the ether somewhere and say, right, we're, I'm going to lead you. Actually, we're all leaders and we want to build an organisation that is, is a, whole num- a whole bunch of leaders can, can actually make those influence. And I think your example, Sheila, about you know, what happened over the Freedom Riders, one person can say, let's do this, this is a positive thing, rather than, oh shit, we're faced with the police, what are we going to do? We'll, we'll go away and regroup. Actually, that can make a difference, give the, you know, a num- number of other people some confidence to say, we can make decisions. And the final thing I'll say is that yesterday was only one day of strike action, which was massive. But you can see within the day, um, one bloke who went, tried to go into work where, where I work, he'd said, oh, I've made some appointments, I can't remember, I'll go on strike in the afternoon. We said, no, uh, you, you can just leave those appointments, they're going to still be there tomorrow, you can sort that out tomorrow. So he parked his bike, came up, sticked himself up, and you see the transformation immediately on someone's face. You see, we've got power. And the, well, the last last thing I'll say is that years and years ago, we had a 17-week strike in, in Cairns, and I work just, well, in this area, um, of housing workers. And they were out on seven, for 17 weeks over, there had been cuts, or they, the, the, the work had increased, and they were trying to not to in, recruit uh, more housing workers. Um, and this woman who was involved in the strike, she retired a few years later and she was interviewed in the local press. And they said, what was the best thing about your 30 odd years working in Canada? You know, wanted to hear <laughs> stories of nice things. And she said, the best time of my life was 17 weeks out on strike where we had control of our lives. And I think that's really where we, mm. we, that's where we start from. And actually we want to influence other people mm. with, the, with our power. Mm. Just going to take the guy in the white T-shirt here, and he's going to be the last speaker, I'm afraid. Right. Uh, yeah, Judith mentioned about the idea that as human beings we're hardwired for kind of like a life of either being a tyrant over people or acquiescing to a tyrant. You know, whether that be that be Stalin and the Russian workers, or it might be you know your shitbag boss and in your office or whatever. And uh, I think that's a massively wide idea, widely accepted idea. The the enormous problem with that idea is that actually, if you look at human history in in the round, 95% of the history of of us as a species, actually we lived in classless societies. We lived in what sometimes is called primitive communism, but we lived in societies of small bunches of hunter-gatherers, and there wasn't someone over you. You know, they were collective, primitive communist societies. They were classless societies. And actually, that's 95% of our history as a species. So actually, if we're hardwired for anything, we're hardwired for communism, to be honest with you. Uh, And it's actually this nonsense of uh, class society of the last couple of thousand years that has actually skewed that in in, in all sorts of ways. And of course, you know, when we talk about, you know, the debate about tyranny, democracy, is it possible to have a socialist communist society today? That's not happening in a vacuum as a debate. It's happening in a class society. And the people that are actually at the top, you know, control the universities, control the media and so on. You know, it's Marxist thing, you know, the ruling ideas in any society are the ideas of the ruling class. They own the means of mental production as well as the means of physical production. And, you know, they're pumping out the idea all the time that actually, you know, ordinary people can't run their lives. And actually, there's a history to that debate as well. You know, 200 years ago, in 1814, let's say, you know, it was, oh, you know, slavery is completely natural, you know? And then we we managed to smash that argument. A hundred years ago, it was, you know, oh, you can't have parliamentary democracy, you can't have ordinary people voting, or you can't have women voting, right? And we've pushed it and we've pushed it to the point where actually I think the next argument is you can actually have the ordinary people, the workers, actually running the whole thing without any bosses whatsoever. And I think, you know, there is that argument going on and and we're part of, I think think we're in the vanguard of of world history in that respect, in terms of pushing the argument about uh, democracy all the way uh, but the, just one last thing I want to come back to the, the comrade that talked about the, the Brixton thing and you know the SWP and the Green Party falling out and so on. I don't know the details of it, but I think what's interesting is how, in our tradition, the Leninist tradition, and, and you look at people like Lenin, the Bolsheviks, and so on, 
it's counterintuitive in the sense that, you know, you'd think that, you know, unity, unity, unity is the way to get most people into activity and so on. And there's a lot of truth in that. But actually, it's counterintuitive in the sense that sometimes there need to be very sharp arguments and disagreements. And I don't know about the Brixton thing. We, you know, if it's, I don't know if it's right? But, and we do get it wrong. But sometimes you have to have sharp arguments and you have to have fallouts, and you have to have a degree of disunity in order to find the right position for the workers to move forward. And when I say it's counterintuitive, I'll give you an example of this. During the First World War, right, when millions of people had been won over by the ruling class to killing each other for, for the sake of profits and so on, you had 38 international socialists met at a place called Zimmerwald, right? to say, how are we going to stop the war? So you've got 38 people, <laughs> right, that are agreeing that this war is just a predatory capitalist war. Now, actually, the pressure there on 38 people, let's all agree because we're up against this, right? And Lenin went along to that meeting and he actually argued with them and fell out with them about actually the best position to have against the war. And you would say to yourself, that, you know, that's just ridiculous, you know, factionalism and splitterism and so on and so forth. Actually, this is the same Lenin that two years later is leading millions of Russian workers out of the war, right? And actually, when, you, when he talks about it, he says, sometimes we need to have these sharp arguments in order to get the clear position for the line of march so that then thousands, then hundreds of thousands and millions are actually fighting in the right direction. Now, and that, you know, that, that idea that sometimes you need to have sharp arguments in order to win millions to unity of action is, is actually counterintuitive, but that is actually, funnily enough, the way it works. Thanks, right, well I'll try to address everything, but if I don't, you can come and see me afterwards. I mean, I think the thing about communications, funny enough, when you said, could we run the minor strike if we'd had, you know, I think it comes up a lot today, doesn't it? I mean, even the Egyptian revolution was called the Twitter revolution, wasn't it? Um, and that sense of communication, I mean, I think communication makes things a lot easier. And when I talk to some younger comrades about the minor strike, they can't believe how we did anything when it was all landlines in your home or in the union office and, you know, you just, could, you know, it was pretty incredible. Um, but the, um, the lo and, and it makes a difference. But let's remember, in the Egyptian Revolution, the state shut down the internet for a huge chunk of the 18 days. I mean, when I was sending the report to Socialist Worker, I had to do them by text and a Blackberry. That was thousands of words just with a couple of thumbs. There wasn't, you know, people didn't have it actually for a lot of it because, so therefore it didn't just stop, you know, when the internet went down, which is what obviously Mubarak hoped. And people had to go and publish leaflets and go back to old fashioned methods and banners and we're gonna march on this day and everything else. But, um, the miners' strike would have been one of the three of the trade union leaders that offered the solidarity the miners deserved, wouldn't it? That's the simple yes. fact, isn't it? If the miners had got the solidarity from the rest of the trade unions, the leadership had called them out, then it, they would have won and they wouldn't have had to be on strike for a year. Mm -hmm. But of course, we are what we are immensely helped by the fact of what technology offers us now in terms of internationalism, in terms of us learning the lessons. <coughs> it's um, it really does make a difference. When you talk about Cuba. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a society that's not a socialist society. And one of the reasons is, is because the nature of the revolt that brought, um, you know, that, that brought them to power. And I think that sense of the workers in that, you know, we're, we're aside, you know, come and support us. You know, you had, you know, a bunch of rebels arriving in a boat, you know, very brave. And, you know, Fidel Castro at its top, you read about some of the... Um, you know, Che Guevara's memoirs are how to hang a hammock in the forest so that you don't get wet at night time, this sort of thing. You know, these were a, this was a very different struggle to mass working class struggle. There were workers, it wasn't like there wasn't any workers and they had struggled, but actually they were the people that clapped and cheered when the guerrillas arrived in Havana. So the sense of when we judge the nature of a revolution, this was not a working class revolution, which then has an impact on the shape of the society that comes from it. And so, you know, our position just to, you know, briefly on, on Cuba is we defend it absolutely against US imperialism, against the boycott and everything else, but actually in no way do we have illusions in that it is anything but a society that, um, that is state capitalist, that has exploitation, oppression, repression, just as China does. Um, but again, there's probably a meeting somewhere on the timetable that we'll be able to go into that in more detail. 
But I think that um, when you look at the question somebody asked then about women in the revolutions, you see, I think it's a very interesting thing. And um, because precisely also because of Islamophobia, because obviously in Britain today, uh, particularly Muslim women, and we know that the tax on Muslim women, because they're sometimes they're more obvious because of their dress, you know, have gone up in recent years. There is a sense of women as victims, you know, as women who are controlled by men, Muslim men, and forced to wear the hijab, etc. Now, when, you know, what was absolutely striking about Tahrir Square in those days, was the mix that I described, you know, of women, some religious, some not, young and old. Um, some had walked for miles uh, from rural areas to be in the square because they'd heard what was happening. Absolutely inspiring. And they'd grab you. I want to tell you, you know, they'd get a young son or somebody else, maybe who spoke English, and say, I want to tell you, I want to tell you where I've come from, why I'm here, you know. And, uh, and a sense what was people were saying was even to be in the square for 18 days, even for them to be there late at night was breaking with taboos of generations. That they said, I would never have been here in the center of Cairo, um, or I would never be here at 10 o'clock at night. And then they were sleeping under tarpaulin with thousands of strangers. You know, that in itself, you know, lifetimes of taboo and tradition was being ripped up. And for those 18 days, you know, the attacks that happened in Tahrir Square happened after the 18 days. There were no attacks during the 18 days. I mean, I wandered around there at any time of the night and day on my own, um, never had a problem. And I know there was Western journalists that were attacked again after the 18 days. But for other women, in a society where sexual harassment is entrenched, I mean, really entrenched, and you say how quickly was it rolled back? It was rolled back almost immediately. You know, in the 18 days when the square broke up, and people hoped that this was the beginning of something new. Um, International Women's Day, only days really after the fall of Mubarak, women were attacked in Tahrir Square celebrating International Women's Day. Thugs came to attack them. And we saw it in various times, women were being targeted specifically. Um, and it was part of an intimidation to get them out of the revolution, to get them off the streets. People might remember a woman who became referred to, unfortunately, as the blue bra women. But people will know what I mean because she's also used symbolically in lots of the graffiti and stuff to show just the brutality of the state. Um, where she was attacked and kicked in the stomach and her um, her veil and gown were pushed up. And of course, you know, for people who actually thought the army was their friend, because it's full of conscripts and the army and the people on one hand, you know, this was very shocking. But it was an attempt again to say women really shouldn't be part of this. And actually what it provoked, not for women to be intimidated, but for some of the biggest demonstrations involving women in the days follow that, saying, defying that, if you like. And so this is what I think is a feature of the revolutions, is that the unity of men and women, I mean, Yemen, you know, you look at the other revolutions, and Saleh in Yemen tried to tell women that it was un-Islamic for women to march. What he also provoked was some of the biggest women's demonstrations in Yemen as a result of that, saying it is Islamic to march, it is Islamic to be part of this protest. But I think women are being targeted precisely because the, the strength of the revolution um, relies on its unity. And therefore, to break women away from it weakens it. And unfortunately, that's why many women have been targeted, both in terms of sexual assault, in terms of um, being assaulted in prison, in terms of being um, locked up. And I think, you know, therefore, it is with great, you know, humility you look at what many revolutionary women and working women have still play a big role. Because you see, let's remember, when I keep coming back to the working class, that actually, let's remember the working class, as Esme described, you know, this isn't some force out there that's going to come and liberate women or liberate LGBT people or liberate black people like some shining knight on a horse. It's who we are. You know, the working class is LGBT, it is women and men, it is black, white and Asian. And that is the same in Egypt because actually some of the struggles that were seeds of the revolution included the Mahala strikes and protests in the textile factories. These were tens of thousands of women have been part of these. Politicized women, courageous, organized women in the class. And so Therefore, when we see the elements of revolution, it can, if you come with sort of the, the, the caricatures and stereotypes of societies, of gender roles, you miss you know, something that's going on underneath. But I think the, um, the question of how the women are treated is something I think um, in Egyptian society that's absolutely to the fore. It's d discussed across the movements. It's discussed as being something that is a, absolutely um, a huge problem for the revolution going forward. But I think, once again, where I said at the beginning that mainstream ideology wants to tell you don't tinker with society because you might unleash worse violence and tyranny. You know, this is what people say in about Syria in a way, don't they? Look what happened if you try and change it. Actually, you know, let's remember this was, this was a deeply sexist society. And it is actually not the case, as, as I understand, and that women have to cover up more. I think it's much more that actually, you know, it is, you know, sexual harassment has, has 
it has was, was always part was you know for a long time part of Egyptian society. It's re, uh, reasserted itself in a very flagrant way, um, and I think in the long run, mo you know, more revolutionary activity and involvement is is the best is the best challenge to that because women are insisting that they will not be pushed out of the um, pushed out of the uh, out of the revolution. And I think, you know, that's a, the lesson, again, I think, as me answered about what is the working class. You know, the working class doesn't look the same as in Marx's day, but if you have to sell your labour or your labour power in order to pay the bills at the end of the week, you're a worker. You know, it doesn't matter what you, how you dress to go to work. You know, when he talks about labour, he doesn't mean the specific nature of concrete labour that you do, whether you're a, you know, whether you push a machine or you type into a computer, whatever. It's about you selling your ability to labour as a human to somebody else who makes a profit from it. And that's what the working class is. So it looks different. It looks like yesterday. Um, it looks like this room. That's what the working class is. And we are the ones with that collective power. On the question about Brixton and divisions, you know, I don't know the specifics. I think Start the War as a movement was one of the great. Um, examples, if you like, of unity. And again, unity both amongst the left, uh, with pacifists, with revolutionaries, with people of faith and none, and, uh, and also with Muslims in Britain. It's something that you didn't see in other Stop the War movements, and it's something I think that stood us in a, I think it enriched our movement, enriched the left, <coughs> and I think for many Muslims who felt under target after 9-11, it made them feel that people were going to stand up for them. And I think this still today is, is an important principle, particularly Young Pride of the SW WP's record in understanding how Islamophobia can, under, uh, can, can do it. But I do agree with the comrade you said, you know, that sometimes, you know, we do want unity, unity against the fascist, unity against austerity and all the rest of it. But sometimes we want to fight for a position that we think against something that's wrong, that's going to lead us into a cul-de-sac, that's going to, you know, politically or in reality, you know, the, there will be times to have sharp arguments, but not just for the sake of some sectarian point scoring. But when things are, you know, when there's things really at stake, sometimes you will have to argue, argue it through. Um, but I think that when we to come back to really where what we're fighting for, if you like, you see, it's not because we would have an arguing the point about what the SW thinks, because we want a society where the SWP can be in control, and that's the best way of stopping a tyrant taking over. Not at all. Our politics is about the self-emancipation of the working class. You know, so therefore we're fighting for our politics and fighting for people here who are not members to join us because we want to be part of a political leadership to shape struggles that will enable ordinary working class people to take control of their lives. And I think Phoebe's example of the strike, you know, you see that, you saw that even with the Lambert striker speaking last night. You know, you, people blossom, you know, they don't become just the, you know, bowed down by just the daily struggle of surviving in a horrible world. Suddenly there's an opportunity, I mean, this is what you, and you see that at its greatest heights in revolutions, and therefore out of revolutions, we become fit to become people to build a socialist society. And that's, you know, so partly I've talked, you know, and it's right, the vast majority of human history, we didn't live under capitalism or even a class society. But that sense of, it's not about we liberating people, because that then just plays into the role that ordinary people don't have the ability to run society and they'll need somebody who's well educated or well practiced in making speeches or anything. No, none of, practice, you know, none of us practice, will be a part of a political leadership revolution. New leaders will be thrown up and be a part of it. But all the time coming back to, if a revolution is going to be victorious, it has to be about the self-emancipation of the working class. The working class have to be at its core, otherwise you end up with distorted societies that claim to be socialist but are not, or you end up having the ability of other social forces, whether it's an individual tyrant or some other force that can hijack, co-opt, or in some way distort a revolution to turn it into something, something it wasn't. So that's why we constantly say join us, because I come back to it. This isn't just about let's become a revolutionary socialist and join a party when there is a revolution. It's building the revolutionary party before we have a revolution that is the best sort of, um, you know, putting it in the bank, if you like, is the best idea of thinking beforehand how we can build an organisation that can actually mean that we win.